Uh, I'm Ashley Bush. I'm a professor at this institute, the Flory Institute. This is a public lecture about Alzheimer's disease, uh, which was uh, originally titled Living with Alzheimer's Disease. Uh, in my case, I've been living with Alzheimer's disease for 25 years, since I first did my PhD after training in psychiatry. I did a PhD with Colin Masters, who was one of the pioneers of Alzheimer's disease research in the world and uh, did his pioneering work in Europe and came back to Australia and uh, was the chair of pathology at the University of Melbourne and I was his first PhD student uh, in Melbourne. So that was 25 years ago and uh, you could ask 25 years of constant research how far have we got and the answer is yes well we've got we've got far but uh, We've also learnt that the condition that we're trying to tackle is a very difficult uh, condition to both understand and to develop treatments for. So tonight I thought I would update you uh, about the causes of Alzheimer's disease, our thoughts on where we, would, we might go in order to develop treatments for this currently incurable disease, what the dimension of the problem is and what our strategies are and how we are doing our research. Uh, in this institute. So, get me on to the first slide. This is a, uh, a very interesting illustration of the process of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, it is a series of self-portraits of quite a notable artist called William Utermolen, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease at the age of 60 and subsequently uh, did self-portraits over the next six or seven years until he subsequently died with the disease. And uh, it's a very nice illustration, a very vivid illustration of how the brain disintegrates with this disorder. You see this obviously very uh, well-formed self-portrait just gradually disintegrates. The features disappear eventually. There's just a representation uh, of a face the amazing thing about this work is that even towards the end, this artist was still very talented. So the ability to actually create art remained. And his tells us something about the qualities of art itself that make it of interest to, uh, to people who are interested in art. But certainly at this point, he was very profoundly demented. So what is dementia? Dementia is a loss of cognitive functioning, that is, a loss of the memory and reasoning portions of the brain. And Alzheimer's disease represents the majority of diagnoses of dementia. So if you were to take all categories of dementia and put them into a pie, Alzheimer's disease represents uh, over two-thirds of that pie. And the other causes of dementia that we understand are vascular dementia. That's where there's an interruption to the blood supply of the brain, and that can come about because of a stroke or a blockage in the arteries that supply the brain. You can have a mixture of both Alzheimer's disease and this vascular dementia, and that, that represents this slide, this part, slice of the pie. And then there are other forms of dementia that are more uncommon, such as frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, and even Parkinson's disease itself can cause dementia. So there are many different types of dementia, many different causes of dementia. And uh, what we mean by dementia is global failure of the brain. In the same way as the heart fails, and you can get heart failure, you get brain failure, and that's more or less what dementia means. So, what are the basic facts about the Alzheimer form of dementia? Currently, there are 342,800 people, approximately, with dementia in Australia, and the majority of them obviously have Alzheimer's disease. Worldwide, there are 44 million, and this is expected to reach 135 million by the year 2050. And the risk for dementia increases with age. And nowadays, it's easily possible to live into an advanced age, uh, well past retirement age, one in three people over the age of 85 have a diagnosis of dementia. So it's a, a very big problem. 
The financial cost of, of managing Alzheimer's disease in Australia is currently about $6.8 billion. And by 2050, about 3% of our gross domestic product is going to be spent dealing with Alzheimer's disease, both in the care of people with Alzheimer's disease, their treatment, as well as in the loss of productivity of the carers for Alzheimer's disease. Because it's said that for every individual who has a dementia, there are three other people around that individual who are affected by the dementia. So they have to spend their time caring for them and so forth. So we've known about Alzheimer's disease for over 100 years, now nearly 110 years since it was first described by Lois Alzheimer, who was a German psychiatrist. It's a neurodegenerative disease. What we mean that by that is that as you get older, there are a variety of diseases that occur to the brain that can exhibit themselves in different symptoms, such as Parkinson's disease, which is another neurodegenerative disease. These are diseases where, for whatever reason, parts of the brain degrade slowly and continually. In Alzheimer's disease, the most prominent symptom is short-term memory loss, and that's often the first symptom of the disease. But there is a steady deterioration that occurs, and eventually the other functions of the brain are lost as well, and that includes loss of long-term memory and changes in personality and behavior. Eventually, the person becomes so incapacitated that they lose their ability to care for themselves, very much as in the Shakespearean sense of returning to infancy and losing control of bodily functions, incontinence, and death, which occurs on average within seven to 10 years from the uh, diagnosis, actually is not from the brain dying itself, but from some other complications, such as pneumonia. So you die with Alzheimer's disease, you don't die from Alzheimer's disease, but the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease would appear on the death certificate. This is a photograph of the first patient that Alzheimer's, this is Alzheimer, if you hadn't guessed already, the, the first patient that uh, Alzheimer diagnosed. Uh, he called her Auguste D. And uh, she had a very aggressive form of Alzheimer's disease, probably one of the uh, forms of inherited Alzheimer's disease that affect about 10% of individuals with a diagnosis. Because this lady, although she looks rather old, was actually only 44 years of age when the photograph was taken. Now, the problem that we have, the main problem we have with Alzheimer's disease is that you, we still cannot make the diagnosis with 100% accuracy without actually having tissue from the brain. And in order to have that, we need to do an autopsy or else we can do a brain biopsy. We can take a piece of brain from a living person, but there are risks with that, obviously. It's not a pleasant thing to do. And more often than not, it's not necessary because, as I say, we can... We can have a, a diagnostic uh, accuracy, which is pretty good, in the order of 80 to 90%. But there's still quite a number of people who we think have got Alzheimer's disease might give them the diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's disease. They wind up having something else, such as the vascular dementia that I, that I showed you earlier on. And we have no blood test or scan that can definitively make the diagnosis. And this becomes terribly important, as I'll explain in a minute. So it's diagnosed by making a clinical assessment and excluding other causes of dementia. So it's possible to, make, uh, to, do, to get evidence for, say, the vascular dementia or Parkinson's disease as a cause of uh, loss of brain function. <clears throat> So we can exclude other causes of dementia and by doing so arrive at the diagnosis that this is probably Alzheimer's disease. This is how we make this diagnosis currently. And it's reliant upon the patient present, presenting with symptoms. So right now, there, it's quite possible that you, that you have Alzheimer's disease in your brain. The process is there, but you don't know that you've got Alzheimer's disease in the same way it's possible to have cancer and you don't know that you've got cancer until it's actually identified. But the way that people with Alzheimer's disease are diagnosed is they have a symptom. So in other words, they have to go see a doctor, there's a problem, and that's how they come to attention. So the treatment for Alzheimer's disease as it stands right now is that there are some causes of dementia 
that are treatable and they represent about 5% of cases of dementia. So there are things like thyroid problems, for example, that can mimic dementia and can be treated medically and cause uh, reversal and improvement of, uh, of the function of the brain. So we treat what we can treat. Having made the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, this, the most common treatment currently is a form of drug which is called an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And you may have heard of drugs like Aricept, for example, which is a most commonly prescribed acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. This drug boosts the concentration of a chemical in the brain called acetylcholine, which increases the communication between brain cells, and so it boosts function. It's effectively a smart drug, and curiously, it was studied, this type of drug was studied in university students and shown to increase their IQ in IQ tests. So you can take it before doing an exam, for example, and get a boost in function and perform better. The other class of drug that's prescribed are NMDA inhibitors, so the ones that are in Australia, uh, Namende, Bixa. These, uh, this drug works by protecting the brain cells from being damaged by another compound which is in the brain causing problems called glutamate. These are the approved drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Neither of them stop the disease from continuing to deteriorate. They buy time. They probably buy on average about six months of increased function. Uh, preventing a person, postponing a person, for example, from going to a nursing home for about six months. It's important also to treat the complications of Alzheimer's disease, and they include depression. So one of the earliest symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is a change in mood. Or epilepsy, which is another consequence of Alzheimer's disease, can arise in uh, older age for the first time because of Alzheimer's disease. As well as that, there's a lot of interest in things that you can take over the counter as possible agents that may help Alzheimer's disease. I'm actually going to touch on this as we head towards the end of this um, lecture because I know a lot of people are interested in this. Uh, and finally, there is the most important category in terms of what we do here, and that is experimental. We are looking for a drug that stops Alzheimer's disease or even better, maybe a drug that reverses Alzheimer's disease, but at this point in time, we'd be happy enough to have a drug that just slows it down so that it buys time. So in dementia, in Alzheimer's disease, the brain loses its mass. That's the main problem, and this is called atrophy. So I have a picture of this. Firstly, you see a normal brain, and I want you to compare it to a brain that's got advanced Alzheimer's disease. And it should be pretty obvious that what's missing is the meat of the brain. There's a lot more space in this brain, a lot more in the way of crevices in the folds of the brain. A brain is basically the shape of a, a pizza that has been folded over and over and over and over again so that it fits in a convenient sphere-like shape on the top of your spinal column. That's why it's all up here. I mean, in terms of circuitry, it might, it might have made more sense to make it flat, but then, then we'd be walking around like, with heads like pizzas. So during evolution, the clever trick was to take all of this circuitry and fold it up and then squish it into the shape of a ball. But you can see that this circuitry is missing here. It's, it's lost. The cells of the brain have died even though the person hasn't died. And you can live without these cells in your brain indefinitely. The cells that you need to keep you alive are in a part of the brain that's very primitive in here, underneath this, really, and they don't die in Alzheimer's disease. They're not affected by Alzheimer's disease. So you continue to breathe and swallow all of those basic things uh, that you need to stay alive. What you lose is the part that has to do with thinking and memory. Now we can use very advanced tools now to map the brain and have a look at this process of brain death, uh, at least descriptively. And um, one of the tools that we have here at the Flory is the most advanced magnetic resonance imaging apparatus that you can get. It's called a seven Tesla magnetic resonance imaging uh, scanner, and here it is being installed into the building. It ha actually, the building had to be built in such a way that it could be lowered in by a crane during, while the building was being built, uh, because it's massive. It's actually behind us. 
uh, near the toilets on this ground floor. Uh, and here is, the, here is it without its casings, and here is it nicely unpacked. Uh, the, the thing costs a fortune, and it has incredible powers. I just wanted to show you uh, this beautiful um, video of how this instrument maps the internal anatomy of your head uh, in three dimensions. So it has the capacity, and this is, this is looping. This is what an, an MRI is doing, which obviously you know, you, you're exposed to no radiation. It's only magnet. It's very safe, and it does what an X-ray really can't do. Here you see it's dissecting. Here's a nose, the teeth, eyes, and obviously there's the brain. Uh, I'll show this happening again. There's the spinal cord, that's the cerebellum. Now it loops again, I'll do it one more time so you can pick up these features. There's the nose, mouth, eyes, brain, uh, spinal cord will appear just there, cerebellum, back of the head, uh, back of the scalp, and there you go. So it's basically sliced the head that way. Now this allows us to do some really amazingly precise measurements of the brain uh, as the brain comes down with Alzheimer's disease or other disorders. Here is an image which is taken of the brain in one plane and this plane up the top. And you can see how much description you can get out of these uh, beautiful images and very high resolution. You can, for example, see that the brain is not just white matter, which you can see the white stuff here, or gray matter, which you can see on the surface. You can also see these dark areas, and that's fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, more or less water, salty water. Now, if you have a look at the same images from a person with Alzheimer's disease, what you will see is that there are less folds, less gray matter, less white matter, and much more fluid. See how big these caverns are here compared to those, or how big this is compared to that. So the brain fills up with fluid and it loses its meat. That's what's happening. Now this kind of description is is useful in terms of seeing something that we would normally have to dissect in order to, to observe, but it doesn't tell us why this occurs. However, it does allow us to take whatever biochemical observations we can of a person while they're alive and link it to the events that are occurring in their brain because this shrinkage doesn't occur overnight. It takes a long time. It takes maybe 15 years. And we can, one of the most important things we need to link it to is the pathology that we see down the microscope, which is what Alzheimer first saw. Now, obviously, Alzheimer didn't have the luxury of the scans, but what he saw down the microscope was that there were two types of protein that were congealing within the brain and shouldn't be there. And they're called amyloid, and this that stands for neurofibrillary tangles. Well, that's that word, neurofibrillary tangles. This amyloid is congealed into a lump that's called a plaque, an amyloid plaque, and its size is about a fifth of a millimeter. And here you see a single brain cell, a neuron, which is filled up with this pro protein, which consists of phosphorylated tau. We know what the protein is that accumulates in here, it's called tau, and we know what the protein is that accumulates in here, it's called A beta. And a lot of time is spent studying these proteins in test tubes and in animals. And the reason we study it is because we want to understand what causes Alzheimer's disease. And I thought I would take advantage of a very, um, a very useful uh, video which has been prepared by our colleagues in Europe, researchers uh, who've been trying to put a good explanation for the public about amyloid and Alzheimer's tau. Alzheimer's disease was uh, described for the a, first a, a time nice in 1907 display. by the German psychiatrist Alois Alzheimer. In performing a histopathologic study of the brain of his patient, August D, suffering from dementia, he brought to light the presence of two types of lesions in the brain, senile plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. He reached the conclusion of a distinct disease of the cerebral cortex. A hundred years later, Thanks to current scientific techniques, research has made a great leap in the understanding of the disease. 
We know that the brain is made up of neurons and that these are interconnected to form a vast network. These connections, known as synapses, enable the transmission of information from one neuron to another. In Alzheimer's disease, 10 to 15 years before the appearance of the symptoms, two main lesions form in the brain. Senile plaques, composed of amyloid beta protein, and neurofibrillary tangles, composed of tau protein. How is the senile plaque formed? On the surface of the neuron is a large protein called APP. Normally, APP is sectioned by enzymes on the surface of the neuron, and it frees a protein called amyloid beta. The amyloid beta protein is then cleared in the body. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, there is an imbalance. The amyloid beta protein is no longer regulated and is found in too great a quantity. The proteins assemble to form indissoluble fibrils and create senile plaques. How are neurofibrillary tangles formed? When a neuron communicates with another, a signal goes from the body, known as soma, to the synapse to transfer the information. The signal passes through the skeleton of the neuron composed of microtubules. These microtubules are stabilized by normal tau protein. In Alzheimer's disease, tau protein becomes defective and detaches from the microtubules. Thus, the skeleton of the neuron dissociate as it is no longer maintained. Defective tau proteins then assemble to form filaments in the neuron. Without the skeleton, the neurons degenerate and connections between the neurons are lost. The abnormal accumulation of tau filaments in the neuron creates neurofibrillary tangles and eventually causes the death of the neuron. How do the two lesions spread throughout the brain? Neurofibrillary tangles and senile plaques do not follow the same pathway in the brain over time. Neurofibrillary tangles first develop in the region called the hippocampus which is essential to memory and learning. They then reach the whole brain following a centrifugal movement. The process causes atrophy, which engenders global dysfunction. The progression of the lesions corresponds with the symptoms of the disease, which begin with memory problems, followed by problems of language, recognition, and incapacity to perform gestures. Senile plaques develop differently. They are initially observed in the cortex, secondly in the hippocampus, and then the senile plaques reach the whole brain following a centripetal movement. Their progression does not correspond to the symptoms of the disease. But numerous questions remain unanswered. We know that the presence of the two cerebral lesions is necessary to develop Alzheimer's disease, since one does not come without the other. But which lesion comes first? Neurofibrillary tangle or senile plaque? The answer is still under debate. Many clinical trials destined to reduce senile plaques in the brain have failed. In fact, reducing them is not sufficient to eradicate the disease. It has now been suggested that well before formation of senile plaques, smaller forms of amyloid beta called oligomers appear to be toxic for neurons, disturbing their communication when they fix onto synapses. It would appear that the toxic oligomers and their accumulation in senile plaques are at the origin of neurofibrillary tangles, which in their turn are responsible for symptoms. The relationship between amyloid beta protein and tau protein is still little understood. What is the exact sequence of molecular mechanisms leading to the development of dementia? What is the role of genetics and environmental risk factors in the appearance of the disease?
Scientific research is essential in answering these questions. Thanks to researchers, Alzheimer's disease is better and better known in its complexity, and new avenues raise real hope for the eradication of this devastating disease. I thought that was a pretty reasonable uh, representation of uh, our main understanding of the, what we call the molecular basis for Alzheimer's disease. There, there's still a lot more to it. So um, you heard in that explanation ref reference to amyloid and its accumulation within the brain. And this, this has been quantified. Uh, we can quantify it both from people who've died with Alzheimer's disease and now we can quantify it with people who are, still, who are alive using technology called PET imaging, positron emission tomography. And this shows you the, the prevalence, so that's the, number, the percentage of people who are positive for the presence of amyloid over lifespan. For, and it's basically not a feature until after the age of 60, that's actually probably not... But sorry, this is the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. It's not a problem until after the age of 60. The prevalence of the amyloid starts much earlier. So you begin to see amyloid within the brain in the 30s. And uh, there is, it rises in parallel with the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. And there is a lag period of about 20 years between the appearance of the amyloid plaques and the onset of the dementia. Now, you don't develop dementia overnight. You don't develop Alzheimer's disease over, overnight. The symptoms encroach slowly so that first there's some loss of function like memory loss and then it deteriorates more. And we're, there are now stages of Alzheimer's disease that precede a diagnosis with dementia. So clearly th those stages occur in this 20 years between the appearance of the amyloid and the actual symptomatology. So it would be very useful for us to be able to, to determine when a person is coming down with this problem in their brain without having to scan their brains, but by being able to say, take a, a sample of blood and say that there is a problem in their blood which reflects the problem in the brain. And this is the search for a biomarker. And what is a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease? What is a biomarker at all? A biomarker or a biological marker is a measurable change in a biological state that reflects disease. And this can be some of the things you are probably familiar with is blood pressure, pulse, heart sounds, x rays, cholesterol levels, and all of these are things which are quite familiar in general practice and as your GPs will have mentioned to you. And uh, they all are a reflection of what's going on in the organs that are relevant to it. So elevated blood pressure means that you are, you've got a problem with uh, your arterial system that, um, or, your, or your heart that can cause a problem later on, such as a stroke or a heart attack or uh, atherosclerosis. And we can deal with this, obviously, with drugs. So just knowing what the biomarker is allows you to start treatment. We have nothing like that for Alzheimer's disease. Firstly, we have no real treatment that can stop the disease, but we don't even have the biomarker yet. We don't have the equivalent of a cholesterol test that can say, hey, look, you are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. You should go on this treatment to lower your cholesterol or whatever it is we think that is going to reflect the Alzheimer's disease and be able to reduce a person's risk. We do have brain scans that can pick up some of these problems, and I'll show those to you. And we can also take fluid from around the brain by putting a needle in the back uh, and, um, and take out some of the fluid from around the spinal cord. This is called the lumbar puncture. It's actually not a particularly painful or difficult procedure. It's just not done a lot in medicine in common. And we can see changes there in there that reflect the changes in the brain in Alzheimer's disease. So why do we need this? We need this because early detection of a disease as a general principle in medicine allows us to intervene and rescue the problem much better than once the, prob once the disease has set in. So early detection equals prevent 
prevent deterioration and more effective treatment. So whatever we are going to have in the end as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease would be best implemented as soon as the person is coming down with the disease, as early as possible. And the same is true of anything in medicine. So if a person has got an infection, it's best to treat them with an antibiotic when, they're, when the total number of bacteria in their body is low compared to when they're being overwhelmed by the bacteria. This is just generally true. So that's one of the things that we need to do. It's a challenge to find this biomarker. We're looking for a needle in a haystack if we're looking in the blood, for example. The, the challenge is that whatever biomarker we're going to use, it has to be, allow, allow us early detection of the disease. So we can see the disease before a person has got symptoms. And as I showed you, for, the, for instance, with the amyloid, you get an accumulation, for example, in your 30s, way before any symptoms occur. In hunting for these biomarkers, we need to have longitudinal studies. There is no choice in Alzheimer's disease but to have studies that hunt for these biomarkers that are going to take decades, because otherwise you just can't know. It's not like I can do an experiment in one day and find a biomarker. I have to find a candidate, see, propose that this is something we should be looking at and see what happens to a person who's well now in 10 or 20 years' time to see how they wound up. We actually do these kind of studies backwards. We collect people and we, we bank their blood. We wait and see what happens to them. We then go back to the blood that's been in the freezer for decades and have a look at what was in their blood at that time that is associated with their outcome. So we do these studies backwards. You need very large numbers of people in order to get such a biomarker because you can't just do it on a handful. This has to be universal, universally applicable if it's going to be useful in clinical medicine. And you need to look at a large set of outcomes. So Alzheimer's disease is a complicated disorder. Uh, there are all sorts of things that you want to be able to predict from what is the age at which a person is going to come down with a symptom to how fast is the velocity of the disease going to be. These are all things that we have, for example, in the treatment of heart disease that we have nothing like this for Alzheimer's disease. We're way behind in terms of, of Alzheimer's disease. The study that we have at the Flory that tackles this problem is called the Australian Imaging Biomarker and Lifestyle Study or ABLE, that's its initials. It started in 2006 and recruited 1,112 participants from the general community. So these are volunteers. Most of the people who we recruited were normal, which is really important because we banked obviously 768 sets of blood and put them in the freezer. And now, uh, nearly 10 years later, the people who have come down with Alzheimer's disease or memory loss of some kind or another, we go back to their blood and say, could we see the signal somewhere in their blood in 2006? We have people who had the uh, interim stage before coming down with Alzheimer's disease, which is called mild cognitive impairment. This is where they have a loss of function in one domain of the brain's function, but haven't come down with a full picture of dementia. And then we had people who had 211 people who had a, a case of Alzheimer's disease by the best diagnostic criteria that we can make before a person dies and we can actually see their brain. Everyone is examined every 18 months and we're now at the 90 month interval, so the sixth set of assessments. Every 18 months we check on them and take a whole bunch of measurements. It is a very large study that requires a lot of researchers. And there's just no other way of doing this properly. These, this is the list of researchers. These are the people who are employed to study this problem. And these are the institutions who participate in this very important problem. Now, there is just no other way of trying to find the blood test that we need. And that blood test would be, or, or whatever it is, it might not be a blood test either, but let, the blood test is what we hope we're going to find. This is a, a, a team effort that requires careful measurement of a person's brain performance, which is called psychometric analysis, combined with taking fluids from them. And gee, we take a lot of blood from our very brave volunteers. And here's a, 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 a lady who will, will take 80 mils of her blood. It's almost like going to the blood bank, a small blood bank donation. And we bank it. We separate it out in different fractions of blood, and we bank it. Here is the liquid nitrogen canister, just one of 
four around the country uh, that contains, in this case, in the order of 80,000 small tubes like this, which contain the different fractions of blood. And we keep it in two parts of the country. It's so valuable, we can't afford for it to even be you know, hit by uh, a bomb or a truck or whatever. It has to be backed up. It's just too valuable. The, the value of this specimen is, is it's priceless. To, to start this up again would cost tens of millions of dollars and uh, obviously a decade of, of uh, the combined effort of all those people. And this is what we're using to do experiments to hunt for the factors that we think would inform us about what we should be measuring to predict people who are coming down with Alzheimer's disease. This study is organized in four main research domains. They are the study of the brain's function and how an individual functions with Alzheimer's disease, the study of an individual's lifestyle, what factors are involved that may, may explain the change in risk in Alzheimer's disease, so things like diet and exercise, imaging of the brain with things like the magnetic resonance imaging apparatus that I mentioned, as well as uh, some other tools that I'll introduce in the next slide, and of course the, the fractions we take from fluids, and they include blood fluids like serum and plasma and platelets and red cells and white cells, and the cerebrospinal fluid as well. So the, w one of the most important tools that we developed out of this is the positron emission tomography for amyloid plaques. So this is a way of seeing in life the presence of the amyloid accumulating within the brain. And it's uh, basically a small dose of radioactive uh, compound which travels into the plaque in the brain and then can be imaged. So pretty much like a, an MRI, uh, except it's not quite, uh, it doesn't give the same sort of resolution. Here's a normal person with a, a signal coming out of their brain. So you're looking at a person's head sliced this way and you're looking down from the top. And this is uh, the head of a, a person with Alzheimer's disease and the red indicates the quantity of the amyloid. So uh, the, st the stronger the brightness and the more red in it, the more amyloid there is. So this person's got a severe content of amyloid, which is at the front of their brain. So the nose is in that direction. But it's, it's pretty much spread throughout the brain. Now, this is a fantastically useful tool for us to be able to study people over 18-month intervals to see how fast does this stuff accumulate and how is it associated with loss of function and other problems in Alzheimer's disease. Tremendously useful tool, and we've published a lot of papers with it, but it isn't cheap. It costs $2,000 per scan. Uh, and it's not currently available as a test in, in clinical practice, although in the United States they're beginning to discuss whether or not it should be deployed as, as a test. But the problem is that even if we had this test currently, if you could go to the doctor and say, look, I'd like to know if I've got amyloid in my brain, the doctor would say, well, then what does that tell you? We haven't got a treatment for the amyloid that's in the brain. And all that tells you is that you're at an increased risk for developing Alzheimer's disease in a few years' time, and I can give you some statistics about that. So it doesn't really change things yet. But we're not at that point where we're going to say, well, therefore, this is not worth doing. This is obviously worth doing. The question we need to ask is, what else do we need to add to this in order to turn this into a test where we can make predictions and use it? And as I mentioned, we've published a lot on uh, information that has come out of this ABLE study. These are just the headings of some of the papers that we've published. Uh, using it, each one, and th this is a, a message I want to give you about the work that we do here and at the other medical research institutes in Australia, is that to produce a fact, and each one of these papers represents a different fact about Alzheimer's disease, each one of them costs $150,000 worth of effort. Right? This particular study, the ABLE study, has already published 150 papers. So although it's cost in the order of $15 million to do the work we've done on the ABLE study so far, it's produced 150 times $150,000 worth of information so far. So this is how we transact our research. This is the message I'm trying to give you here is that we, research is expensive, but at the same time we give back what is spent in, in the process of trying to 
find answers for such an important problem. And unfortunately, there is no choice but to concede that this is a slow process because Alzheimer's disease is a slow disease. So this is a graph which shows you a change in some of the biomarkers that I mentioned over a lifespan where a person comes down with Alzheimer's disease at year zero, and this is working backwards to minus 30 years. So after zero, they're demented. And here are changes in five things that we've been measuring, and we know what the trajectory of these changes are. So this is the most interesting one. This is the amyloid deposition that we can measure with that uh, PET scan, with that uh, radioactive scan. And we can see that there is, uh, it accumulates up to 30 years before the onset of the diagnosis. So we'd love to be able to intervene here with a drug and say, so we'll just get rid of it before there's any chance of it being a problem, before these other things happen. And these involve the loss of gray matter and impact upon memory function and impact upon other functions of the brain, which creep up in the last five years before the onset of the diagnosis, where you say this person is definitely sick. So it's this part here, which is equivalent to saying having high cholesterol. You intervene with high cholesterol even when a person appears to be otherwise completely well. You give them a drug and get rid of the cholesterol and stop a lot of trouble later on. This is what we hope will be done with Alzheimer's disease with scans like this, where we can see what's going on before it becomes a problem. So I, I know that you will want to hear about drug development, and it's been a, uh, a battle to come up with drugs for Alzheimer's disease. There is every effort not to guess where to make a drug. And the most likely target has been this amyloid. But as that video explained, there have been a lot of failed clinical trials in dealing with the amyloid. We've had compounds that drugs and antibodies that can interact with the amyloid and pull it apart. But clinical trials haven't been successful yet. And this is probably because the drug has been tested too late in the disease. So it would seem that at a certain point after a person is demented, this kind of approach is not going to work. Now, the same is true of trying to treat a person with an anti-cholesterol drug once they've had a heart attack. In other words, once the death of the tissue has occurred, it might be too late to stop what caused the disease. So in this case, we can't bring back dead brain tissue, but if we could stop the amyloid, we might have a chance of stopping the disease from getting worse. Eventually, the first real candidate breakthrough has been announced, and it came out in March this year, which used an antibody. It was an antibody from Biogen, and it works like this. Here is a, a picture of an antibody blown up millions and millions of times. The way that antibodies work is that they have sticky regions that identify things called antigens. In the case of the antigen that's interesting for Alzheimer's disease, it's amyloid. So we want an antibody that's going to stick to an antigen which is in the amyloid. And the concept was this. I've drawn a, a, a synapse here. Remember in that video, we are talking about how the oligomers of amyloid, the early sp species of the amyloid plaque, form at the synapse, so that's a connection between two nerve cells. So I've just got the ends of these nerve cells and the amyloid has gravitated into this region. There's not much of it, it's a tiny amount at this point in time, it's way before it's forming a plaque. And the concept that Biogen had was, <clears throat> let's not try to get rid of the plaques, let's try to draw out this stuff. And this is how it works, basically grabs uh, a, a, a one of the strands of the amyloid oligomer and it takes it away. And then the tissue degrades it and the antibody is just helping to debulk this material. So it's a little bit similar to trying to stop the buildup of cholesterol in an arterial wall before it blocks, the, blocks off the blood supply completely. So this is a, a principle of dealing with the lesion early, dealing with the pathology before you get a heart attack, in this case, before you come down with Alzheimer's disease, you, you try to get rid of the buildup. Now, here's a buildup which you, can, you could probably actually see with your eye. You can't see the buildup of the amyloid with your eye. And um, our approach at the Flory is very much related to that, where our 
contribution to the science behind this is the discovery that zinc is responsible for causing the cementing of these oligomers, the small pieces of amyloid, to the synapse, to that part of the brain that gets affected. Because you see lots of zinc in these oligomers that are coating the interface between the two neurons. So where the two neurons are meant to be talking to each other, there's this buildup of amyloid which is causing problems and the zinc holds it together. So the idea is can you create a drug uh, that finds that particular, you could call it an antigen if you like. And PBT2 is a drug which was that we developed in uh, partnership with a drug company nearby and that drug finds this particular complex and it takes it away. A similar idea. And we, we, and then it gets degraded. Now we can test any drug candidate you like and we obviously want to test out in animals before we test out in humans because we don't want to waste people's time, we don't want to expose people to risk and we can get through a lot more testing with a mouse than we can get through with human beings. Why? Because we can store lots of mice in boxes. So we like to get diseases into mice when we're testing drugs. Uh, to create a, a, a mouse with Alzheimer's disease, we take a gene that we know causes the inherited form of Alzheimer's disease. We inject the gene into the egg of a mouse. Here you can see the egg of a, of a mouse being held by a glass, uh, tiny glass rod. So it's held there, and here is a micro-injection. So a tiny little injection injects DNA straight into the nucleus of the egg. And this mouse now carries the DNA that causes Alzheimer's disease, and it gets a head full of amyloid. So this is, this is within 12 months of age, and we use these mice to screen for drugs. There's the standard model. That's what Biogen used. That's what our partners who made PBT2 used. The problem is this is a pretty expensive exercise. Each one of these mice costs $400 to make, we need to make at least several hundred of them in order to screen for one possible drug. And they also cost $10 a week to keep in boxes upstairs. And we have about, at the floor, we have approximately 10,000 mice on the sixth floor. <laughs> you, you can almost hear them. It's actually a problem when they cook up things in the cafe downstairs. Uh, it, it gets them all excited. So we actually had to reduct all of the uh, air conditioning in order to cope with that problem. You can you imagine when they, when they start cooking things like cheese fondue, what happens? So I want to show you some, how we test these mice out with drugs. This is this drug I mentioned that captures the zinc within the uh, oligomers. And this drug, uh, uh, here we are testing it. This is a uh, transgenic mouse with a head full of amyloid at eight months of age and it's put into a milky pool of fluid and mice don't like to swim. It's trying to find uh, a way out of this situation and what it will do is it'll swim around this pool looking for a way out. There are signs around the pool by the way where it can orientate itself. It can see a star here or something else here so it can see where it is. It knows where it is in, th in three dimensions. We can see, but it can't see, a submerged platform underneath this milky pool of fluid. And it's, if the mass continues to swim long enough, eventually it will find this platform and say, hey, I'm, I'm okay, I, I've survived. We obviously don't let any mice drown. Uh, and we give them 60 seconds before we think that they're not going to be able to find it. Now, in the case of this little guy, he, came, he comes close, and if we wait the full 60 seconds, he finds the platform and we count the time it took. That took 60 seconds. Now we treat the same mouse with this drug and it's being treated only, sorry, I'll go on to the next slide. <laughs> I'm gonna have to click this twice. Right, it's been treated for six days with this drug. And this is its ability to find that platform. So it's, this is, these mice have been in this situation for four times in a row. This is the fourth occasion. The mouse on the left didn't get the drug after four times of being in the situation. It can't remember where to go. The mouse on the right got the drug. It's got the Alzheimer's pathology. After four, situ four times of being in this, uh, this maze, it managed to remember perfectly well where that platform was. And that's how a normal mouse 
uh, behaves. It's a very impressive result, and this drug is continuing to be tested in the clinic. It's currently being tested for Huntington's disease, which has a relationship chemically with some of the problems in Alzheimer's disease. And it could be that this drug would be approved for Huntington's disease before it ever gets tested again for Alzheimer's disease. But these are kind of some of the systems that are involved. And we upstairs have got some pretty fancy technology for having a look at the metals of the brain that we think are involved in Alzheimer's disease. And this shows you our ability to actually scan the metals in the brain in three dimensions. This is the brain of a mouse. We take the brain of the mouse and we can actually do this kind of three-dimensional work there. I show this to you just to boast a little bit about the Flory's expertise. And, and one of the m most important facets of our work here is to understand why age itself is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And to understand this, we have to understand what chemical changes in the brain occur with aging that increase the risk for Alzheimer's disease and cause these proteins to lose the plot and turn into pathologies. And you'd be surprised how many different approaches we have for this problem. I and mean, this is the most important question about life in general, is why do we die? And to tackle a question that is so fundamental, we can't study just humans. This is obviously, there are a lot of humans, but we can't experiment with them. We go the other way. We go to the early organisms, simple organisms that die. And we ask the question, what is it about life, even for a worm, that makes that worm die? And here you see a, an electron microscopy uh, image of a worm. It's one millimeter long. And we have millions of them upstairs. We've only got tens of thousands of mice. We've got millions of worms. <laughs> and we study their lifespan. So here you see the lifespan of a set of worms. So this is in days on the x-axis, and this is the number that are surviving, 100% survive here until around about day seven or so, they begin to die off. By day 20, they're all dead, right? And this is a typical lifespan of a worm. So what we can do is we can manipulate these worms with genetics and all kinds of things. People don't worry too much about experimenting with worms. But we can do some really cool things. And one of the cool things that we've been doing is to, as I mentioned, metals, we've been changing their metal content. And we've changed them with this particular drug, which lowers the amount of iron that's in their bodies. And as a result, we can increase their lifespan. From a median lifespan of about 10 days, we can increase their lifespan at a low dose to about 16 days. And at a high dose, we can increase their, their average lifespan to 20 days. Now, this is very nice if we can translate this kind of drug into humans. <laughs> because this is where we all want to be. Right? This is, we want to be able to live to 100 and, and continue to sin. And that's our ambition here. And we, we are trying to aim for that, for that ambition. I'll end off by talking to you quickly about practices in Alzheimer's disease treatment that involve over-the-counter over the approaches, because I'm asked a lot about this. So I thought I'd preempt the conversation by saying that there is in the medical literature quite a bit of discussion now about alternative approaches that drug companies are not interested in, because the drug companies can't make any money out of it. Drug companies are only interested in what they can make money out of, and in order to make money, they need to have patents. There are lots of things you can buy over the counter that are never going to be patented, that have been there for ages. It's a problem in terms of medical research, and it's a problem in terms of being a consumer with a condition like Alzheimer's disease, where you wonder, what else could I potentially do that doesn't involve a pill that a drug company is selling me in a bottle? And Without going into great depth right now, I just want to say that there are people who are looking at this, taking it quite seriously. And this is a table from a paper written by quite a prominent Alzheimer researcher that lists a number of things that he attempts with his pa patients that are supported by research. And there's some interesting things, such as optimizing sleep, improving exercise, brain stimulation, that is to say with uh, uh, mental exercises. Uh, controlling inflammation with an anti-inflammatory diet or curcumin or um, fish oil. Um, to antioxidants, uh, such as things in blueberries, uh, 
and uh, improving mitochondrial function, the energy supply of tissue with a number of agents which you can buy over the counter and that are known to improve function in animals but haven't been tested in humans. And things like uh, uh, types of um, triglycerides that are known to in also potentially enhance mitochondrial function such as coconut oil which is a main component of a, of a nutraceutical that you can buy actually over the counter in Australia called Suvenade and I have no conflict here I don't I don't have any connection to the company that sells this but it is it is marketed as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease and there is a clinical trial that supports its use and patients who ask me what options they have I also include this so there are a number of things which actually make sense and are supported by by literature and are supported by good authorities such as Dal Bredesen from San Francisco where you can offer your patient, if they're early enough in the course of the disease, something to try to slow down the disease. So I do not regard Alzheimer's disease as being, as it were, a death sentence or something where we're just going to have to take the tablets that, you're, that are in the prescription. I want to end off completely now that I've finished talking about Alzheimer's disease. I want to talk to you a little bit about research because it's an imp we're going through an important epoch right now where I would like uh, the general public to know about this. How do we pay for what we do? What I have here, for your enjoyment, is a grant. This is a grant application, one of my grant applications. Um, you're seeing it page by page. This is the science part. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, what are we up to now? We're talking about, this is the budget. It's going to take a long time for me to go through all this, so perhaps I'll, I'll get to the point. This is the success rate for grant applications in Australia from 2007 onwards. This is in percent on the y-axis. So it starts off at 28%. By last year, it has fallen to 15%. Can you see a trend here? OK, so if you were in a researcher in Alzheimer's disease and you submitted a grant, your probability of success last year was actually less than the national average, it was 8%. Now these are all statistics you can get online, right? I'm not making this up, this is not an opinion. So consider how my colleagues and I, this is one document, this is one grant, and it would support maybe 20% uh, of the work that's done in my laboratory if it was funded. The probability of success, though, is only 8% currently. It used to be, you know, what, many-fold better than that. It's changed very much since 2007. In the Financial Review, there was this comment uh, by a researcher from the Vic Chang Institute. Of the 3,700 applications submitted to the NHMRC, that's our major funder, last year, just about 15% were funded. That's the lowest success rate in the 75 year history of the system and it's expected to fall further. So this is how the NHMRC itself predicts, projects the success rate. Remember I said 28% was successful in 2007? This is what they're telling us is going to happen in 2020. Okay, so for Alzheimer's disease, in 2015 the anticipated success rate is 5%. So this is beginning to sound like my farewell lecture, I think. <laughs> so I wanted to show you this. I wanted to use my 25 years of medical research and my PhD and my medical degree to calculate how much work do I have to do to get a grant funded. This is the formula. <laughs> and if C is the probability of success, and I told you it's 5% next year, for Alzheimer's disease and R is the risk of total failure and N is the number of applications in that formula. You can calculate how many grants you have to write before you have a 50-50 chance of getting one funded. So I'm talking about an even chance, like imagine a footy match, you want to see an outcome which is a competition, one side will win, you know, most people will go see a footy match on that basis. Just want one winner. How many grants do I have to write? before I've got a 50% chance of having one funded? The answer is 14. So consider that. I write 14 grants before I can feel like I've got an even chance of having the money awarded. 
and indeed, I had to deal with this. <laughs> so, since the grant season commenced in October last year, these are the grants I've written. I wrote 17 grants. Those are, those are all of them. I thought you'd be interested in seeing this. Because I wanted to explain to you that we in Australian medical research institutes are actually facing a crisis. Because it's, it is an expensive business. We're there for the long haul, obviously, in Alzheimer's disease. We want to stay committed to working in this area. But we're facing a situation where there does not seem to be the resources in the country to continue. And I'm not sure what the solution is, but I do know that in the United States there is a lot more public support for research than there is in Australia. So I'm speaking to you from the heart by saying that we are a medical research institute that also could benefit from your support. And it's increasingly obvious that we have no choice but to go to you to ask you directly to say that if you are interested in us continuing to do research on the cause and treatment of Alzheimer's disease, I don't know that we have any other choice but to ask you directly to pay for it. So there is a donation capacity at the Flory. There is an online donation form. I would ask you to consider this. Um, it's, it's sad that it's come to this. Clearly, the, the country is, has got some issues in terms of its economy. That may be to blame, but I've just shown you the facts. You can decide what the causes are for those facts yourselves. What I would like to say is that I'm blessed with a large team of people who have backed me and grown over the last quarter of a century uh, to work uh, as hard as they can to find that cause and the treatment for Alzheimer's disease. They don't want to give up. We don't want to give up. We think we're making progress. Uh, and I hope that the, some of the scientific facts behind what I've shown you tonight give you some confidence that we are on the right path and that we are optimistic that with enough time and enough resources, we will get the treatments that we need for this disorder. Thanks for, this. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>